Hello and welcome. This time around I want to do something new, which was supposed to involve a bit of 3D printing, but that plan was greatly reduced. I will be making electric scooter. I had this idea for quite a while, longer than I want to admit. But it is the time to finally start building, especially because I have a motor, battery and ESC from some older project. As usual, when I start working on projects like this, I watched a buttload of videos on YouTube looking for some inspirations. Eventually I have settled on buying a used normal scooter with the air pumped tires. The reason is quite simple. Scooters with small skate wheels usually have a narrow frames and it will be harder to fit it in a motor inside it. Of course it's not impossible to convert a scooter like that. But that would require remaking the rear axle and I'm not really confident in my metalworking skills. The thing is, for me it only makes sense if I can make either something cheaper and almost as good as an off-the-shelf product, or I can make something better with similar costs. I'm not really fond of making projects and dumping enough money until something works, so I will try to keep the cost within a reason for this type of scooter. If I can't, that will be in my book a failed project. It took me quite a while to find a suitable scooter, and I eventually bought it for 20 bucks, disassembled it, cleaned it, and bought a couple of things that I will need for conversion. A couple of screws, bearings and big steel plate to cover the battery for around 30 bucks total. Biggest problem was fitting the motor on the rear axle. Because my motor was designed for the longboard, it doesn't really fit the scooter. If you don't have a motor, I highly recommend buying a hub motor that already has a tire. Trust me, it will save you a lot of headache. Needless to say, the beauty of the DIY is to overcome the problems. I had plenty of ideas in my head. First and most promising was to order a piece from the lathe shop made out of aluminium or maybe even steel. Basically a custom small rim. However, when I designed it and asked for a quote from a couple of shops, I've heard prices around 100 to 200 dollars. Unfortunately that is too expensive. Maybe if I had laid myself it would make sense but I don't. So the next idea was to try to 3D print it instead. Inspired by this video where a guy printed a real car rims, I thought to myself weight shouldn't be a problem, but the heat from the motor may be. So as a result I have this 3D printed rim from the Pet G and initial test turned pretty good. There was absolutely no bending or breaking even if I stood with my whole weight on it. In order to make the motor fit the original mount, I had to trim the sides of the aluminum. It was pretty easy. You can do it with a jigsaw, angle grinder or even a handsaw. Harder part was manufacturing a square pin that would keep the motor locked in place. I cut a small piece of brass, made a hole in it and slowly sanded edges till it could be a lock for a motor. After that I used an aluminium spacer on the other side to make sure the motor is in the center, secured it with a stock screw that came with the scooter, which turned out to be a pretty nice fit. Bear with me for a moment until I get to the electronics part, because it was a time when I finally did the initial testing outside. And let me tell you, it was a big failure. While the motor itself was somewhat spinning, and it even had some energy to propel me forward, it was far from satisfactory. It couldn't get me uphill to the even the slightest slope. I didn't even record it because after one minute of testing I took the scooter and went back to the drawing board. Obviously solution for me was to buy a used motor from an existing scooter something around 300 to 350 watts and try to fit it on my scooter. Luckily I found one for around 50 bucks from the 9bot AS4. It wasn't the best option I had but the reason why I've chosen this specific model was because it was slim 
and had no mechanical brakes on it. Unfortunately, that meant for me scrapping all the work I have done to fit the longboard motor. That also means neither my 3D printer rim will get some attention nor my hot glue filled tire. But still, I decided to talk about it because maybe you can learn from my mistake. I suspect that originally hub motors for longboards were used in pairs. So using just one makes it to have half the torque. Not only have I used just one of those, but I have also increased the wheel diameter twice. So technically my scooter had one quarter of a longboard torque. But I did not give up and decided to continue. Of course, projects like this are never easy and well, I didn't have a backup plan, so I had to improvise and make some mounting for a new motor. It is still in production, so I will not cover it in this part of the video. I did some initial testing with some rough mounting and that unfortunately bent my aluminum axle. However, the result was satisfactory. It wasn't the monster when it comes to speed or torque, but it was certainly usable. I will try it in the next video to record how it works and maybe do a couple of improvements in the future, such as 3D printed box for display and thumb stick. I've learned a very important lesson to choose motors carefully for the projects I'm making. And I'm not going to repeat it again whenever I will be building my electric unicycle. I will use a motor specifically designed for electric unicycle. Now time for part 2 of this video which will be setting up electrical connections and configuring the motor in VSC. A little disclaimer before we begin, working with electronics can be dangerous, especially if you are working with lithium ion batteries. Also, don't take my works for granted. I'm still pretty much beginner when it comes to configuring VSC, so I recommended watching videos from someone more experienced. I will link two of them in the description below. Nevertheless, I will try to convey the knowledge I've gained the best way I can. First of all, what is VSC? It's an open source project made to drive the brushless motors. It is pretty widely adopted for stuff like electrical vehicles, drones and other applications. However, what makes it so interesting is the fact that you can buy VSC boards in wide varieties, power ratings and physical sizes. And what's best? Besides connecting wires, you usually don't need to do too much electrical work to get it up and working. Program to set it up is completely free as long as you register on VSC project website. Keep in mind that mobile applications are not free, though they are fairly cheap. One thing I should mention before we begin is that VESC is not easy, especially if you don't have any experience with motors or batteries. Even though I had some experience in the past, I had to go to the Discord and ask plenty of questions before I had my setup running. So let no one fool you that it's beginner friendly, it's really not. I will not tell you which motor you should choose for your own application because there are hundreds if not thousand different motors and I really can't cover everything here. What I can tell you is my experience with three motors I have configured. First one will be longboard motor of an unknown rating from some old project. VESC detects it as around 30 amps. Second motor is a 9 bot AS4 stock motor which is rated for 300 watts. And the third one is a Kingsong 18XL 2.2 kW. I have also three different VESC board. First one is a cheap no name that you can get from the AliExpress for around 50 bucks. Second one is the Trampa board VSC6. And the third one is U-Box Single rated for 100 volts and 100 amps. When it comes to differences between boards, the cheapest one had a lot of problems. And I'm not sure if I'm unlucky or my board was just really old and worn out. But I know I couldn't get hull sensors to work until I soldered the wires directly. Maybe there was something wrong with the JST connector. Aside from that, motor had severe problems with torque that were not present on other boards. 
What I do know is that I won't be using this for projects that I want to work reliably for longer periods of time. Trampa board was plug and play. I had zero issues with it. Connected the 9 boot motor and everything worked from the start. It is a bit more expensive, but well, you get what you pay for. Third VESC I had configured was a Spintent U-Box single. I didn't have any issues with that one either. What makes it so special is that it has integrated IMU, which is basically a chip with accelerometer and a gyroscope. I will be needing it for my electric unicycle. When it comes to connection, you will need to connect your motor to the VESC board using three thick wires. It doesn't matter how do you connect them. You will also most likely need to connect it to the battery as well as the USB. From my test, neither Trampa board nor a U-Box will even boot up without the battery. The $50 clone was able to, but you still won't be able to configure motor without power supply, and you certainly won't be pushing enough current through the USB. After everything has been plugged in, simply click the Auto Connect button on your VESC tool. Sometimes VESC will tell you to update your firmware because it's too old, but a word of advice. Not every VESC is fully compatible with newer firmware, and in case it goes wrong, you may have to use a J-Link to unbrick it. If you are not sure if you can update the firmware, don't do it. For example, U-Box isn't compatible with official firmware, and they make their own forks. Once you get that out of the way, you can start configuring your motor, and there is a wizard that will streamline this process. Simply click the Setup Motors FOC button. That will show you a window where you will select which motor you have. And I have some doubts in my mind, so I simply went to VESC Discord and asked which one should I choose. If you are unsure, this is something I would recommend. Second step is configuring your battery. And there are pretty much the only interesting here is how much battery cells are in series. For example, if you have 10S3 battery, you will put 10 here. It is needed for calculating the cutoff voltage. Next step is gear ratio setup. In case you have a hub motor, you will check the direct drive because it doesn't have any gears. Wheel diameter is needed for speed calculations and motor pulse is something you should take from the specs of the motor. After that you will be running detection and here is an important thing. Before you click that button, you need to make sure that your motor can spin freely. Either you attach it to some solid rig or to a vehicle you already have. But you cannot simply hold it in your hands and hope for the best. It won't work. I've tried that and let me tell you this is a really bad idea. <laughs> Once run detection is over you should see a result. Important thing to note is the last line. Sensors. You should see HAL sensors in this bracket, and that way you will know that you have connected them correctly. On the other hand, if you see sensorless, either your motor doesn't have sensors, or you have connected them incorrectly. All three of my motors had HAL sensors. Two of them additionally had temperature sensor. In most cases they are color coded. Black is usually ground. Red is the power supply, green, yellow and blue are the sensors themselves, and white is a temperature sensor. This may not be true for every motor, it was true for all the motors I had. Last step is making sure your motor spins in the correct direction. You'll have two buttons, forward and reverse. Simply click the forward and if you see that motor is spinning in the opposite direction, check the inverted checkbox. Once you confirm direction, you should be good to go. Alternatively, you can swap any of the two motor wires and that will do the trick as well. Once you finish the wizard, make sure to click the M button with the arrow down. This will write the motor configuration to the VESC. Although that should happen automatically after the wizard, it may not always be the case. And once the wizard is done, you will need to focus on the motor settings. General current. This is one of the most important settings you should always check before actually riding your vehicle. You will need to limit your current for the motor and while a wizard 
does actually pretty good job of detecting current, always double check those two settings. Absolute maximum current shouldn't exceed the VASC board rating you have, and I was told it should be approximately 50% more than the motor current max. Now a bit more confusing part. Battery current max here you want to make sure to never exceed the rating of your cells. Let's say for example you have 10 S3 battery and each of the cell is rated for 10 amps continuous discharge. You will be putting 30 amps and minus 30 amps here. Skim over the other tabs for some sanity checks and if you are unsure if everything is configured correctly or you have a problems, I will link VASC Discord server in the description below. Last step would be to configure the input. In case of my scooter I will be using a joystick which is just a fancy potentiometer, but you will need to find a guide for your input method if you want to know how to configure it. There is a wizard for that as well. This will be it for today's video, hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something or at least you found it entertaining. If you liked it, hit that subscribe button, it will help me get motivated to do more builds in the future.